Coming to you from a portable microphone, this is Don't Get Me Started. This is a conversation about advertising. And here is your host, freelance creative director and creative circus department head, Dan Balser. Yes, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. And um, I've said this before, you're tired of hearing me say I'm excited for this one. I think the forum was thrilling. Uh, It was invigorating. It was stimulating. It was uh, mentally um, entertaining and enlightening. And uh, if you have not done your homework and already gone to the Facebook page to see links for Chris and Mike's work, do so. Facebook.com slash DGMS podcast is the de facto home for the pod. And I just realized what happens when Facebook decides not to host that anymore. I have a web page too. It's called Balserville.com and uh, it's free of charge. It's part of the internet that requires no payment. There's no free version and premium version of this podcast. It's all available for your viewing and listening pleasure nothing to look at. It's just listening. Uh, ten and a half years worth free of charge at Balserville.com and the iTunes store. Let's see, what should we talk about? Uh, Chris Jokum and Mike Donaghy have been creative team for the past 13 years. Um, a friend of mine just celebrated his 14th wedding anniversary and he looked tired. <laughs> he looked tired. Um, yeah, I get that. Uh, yeah, that makes sense. In, the time, in, the, in that time, they've created Can Gold winning campaigns at three different agencies in three different countries. Chris and Mike's work has received gold prizes at every major award show in the world, possibly other worlds, including Can Lion, One Show, The Clios, and the London International Awards. In 2017, their innovative saving campaign for Jet.com won a Can Grand Prix in media. Their Skittles Touch campaign is featured in the latest edition of Luke Sullivan's book, Hey Whipple, Squeeze This. Hi, Luke. And this year, their campaign, The Love Cam, was inducted into the permanent collection at the Museum of Modern Art. Correct. And received an Emmy nomination. And as of this publication, we will know for sure whether or not, we are assuming it will, win an Emmy. Chris and Mike began their careers in Toronto, Canada, where they were creative leads on brands such as World Wildlife Fund, Skittles, and FedEx. In 2012, they left Toronto to move to London, England, as global creative leads for the Philips Sound Business and Amnesty International at Ogilvy & Mather, London. In 2014, Chris and Mike moved to RGA New York, where they are now creative directors. They currently work across a range of clients, including Samsung Global, Jet.com, and Ad Council. And they're funny, and they look really, really young. And I'm not—I'm wondering if that's because I'm getting old. And um, welcome to the Creative Circus. Welcome to the library, folks. If you hear some humming, it's the air conditioner. It's 90 degrees U.S outside today and uh welcome to the temperature u.s temperature welcome guys thank you thank you for having us okay that felt like you were a bit reading the credentials of khaleesi Khaleesi? daenerys it's like breaker breaker of chains (laughs) mother of uh, it's like we got to write a shorter bio I'm pretty yeah. sure I read that <laughs> verbatim. Well, no, you know that was good. We, we didn't know that why we were sending that. Yeah, I think it looks it looks shorter than it sounds. <laughs> no, it's good. That's off your uh, your internet web. That no, that mm-hmm. is correct. That is all correct information. It sounds like stuff we'd say about ourselves. I pulled that right off the information <laughs> superhighway. Um, so, Chris yeah. and Mike, I think I've got this right. Chris, you're the copywriter. I am. Chris is the one you'll hear with the beard. He's the one with the beard that you're going to hear the words coming through. And Mike Donaghy, who's sitting in between Chris and me, is art director. Um, how is the day? How how's the, how things been? What are your impressions of the portfolios? How has how does it feel sitting in your position now doing this? Do you guys let's start there? Do you guys do stuff like this often? Um, we 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 used to do it more. I mean, we used to do more portfolio reviews um, with students uh, more in Canada. Um, go look at student books. Um, we've hired a lot of interns at mm-hmm. previous agencies as well, but we haven't done it in a while. It was fun. That's I great. think, that was I think we, we came up in Canada, so we had a lot of yeah. connections to the school systems there and, and a lot of the agency people. So you're more connected to that. And so we're relatively new to the U.S., so hopefully we'll be doing more of this in the mm. future. Yeah. Do, you enjoy, do, you, do you enjoy being tapped to do speaking things and stuff like that? Um, I yes. do. <laughs> yeah, you're good. Well, you're very good at it. We enjoy it. It's cool. Yeah. Okay, um, so... Is there a difference between the student's portfolio today and the student's portfolio a year, two, three, five years ago? And and, and uh, this is sort of a, a question for the listeners that may be in school. Um, what are those differences? And one thing that you guys talked about in your presentation, which I think was really cool, is 
sort of the difference between saying, which is from the old school um, advertising industry, and doing, and basically proving your ethos as a brand through through action. Are those the kind of things that can be shown in a portfolio? I mean, some of the stuff that you guys have done that's amazing, I guess you could show in a portfolio, theoretically, the Amnesty International candle bit. Um, I guess you could sh- you could comp that and show that as a thing. But I don't, I don't know about Love Cam. I don't know if that's really a great book piece in theory. That's, mm-hmm. that's a thing that has to be experienced. It has to be seen, right? So you understand the nature of my question of like sort yeah, of like yeah. doing things that, that are spec. It's not the same as doing a spec ad where you actually have to write and design a spec ad. You can't really – what are you showing if you're coming up with an idea for a – a do type of thing. I think unfortunately because, um, you know, in a portfolio, something needs to be read really quickly. Mm -hmm. Otherwise it sucks. Um, that does kill a bunch of work. So I think, yeah, maybe you're right about love cam actually is that 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 wouldn't really work in a portfolio. Um, but generally I think it's probably a, a decent truism that if a idea is so complicated that you can't show it on a slide, it's probably too complicated. Mm -hmm. It's probably not a great idea. I mean, that's the way we show our clients. We don't, do mock-ups or film anything ahead of time. We present it usually on a slide. We usually don't have, you know, 20 minutes to talk about one thing. And you're, so, and you're, uh, but, and you're also often there, right? Yep. I mean, yeah. That's huge. Yep. Definitely. I'm, I'm not being like silly about that, but no, 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 you're right. You're right. I think, I think it does passive. kill a lot of ideas. Like a lot yeah. of ideas that probably are great ideas in the real world might not be great portfolio ideas. And I think it's a, it's a hard thing to determine which ones maybe need to be cut because of that. Mm-hmm. But what I will say is today, we didn't see any storyboards. And that was super refreshing. Yeah. We don't, we don't, I don't think that's good. Yeah. I don't no. think it's good to have them. Yeah. And it might be an amazing, it might be your best idea as a TV idea, but if you're going to express it as a storyboard, it's not really great for a, a student book. Mm. How do you guys feel about looking at portfolios with print ads in them? I, f- I feel good. About, I mean, I think a portfolio should have the simplest articulation of a campaign idea. So I think it's important to have, whether it's a print ad or it's a social post or whatever, something where it's, you know, essentially a visual with a a line that expresses Mm -hmm. whatever you want to say. I think that's important because it's important to see if someone can write, if they're a writer, if they can design a piece um, in a simple way that communicates something, if they're a designer or an art director. Um, But it also works in a book. It works if you're looking at it on a website. If you happen to be reading someone's portfolio, people still do book books. I don't yeah. know. I think that's a lot a of thing. I think a lot right. of its context as well. Right? Yeah. I mean, if if we're seeing print ad after print ad, that's probably not ideal. Right. But if yeah. it's a print ad that's bringing a larger idea to life, mm-hmm. then that's yeah. amazing. We yeah. love seeing that. It's really cool. I, I liked seeing today even the range of thinking as well. So if you let's say you started with a print ad, but then how does that blow out into other things, right. other other media, um, right which at. a lot of students are thinking about, which was interesting. Right. I'm going to show a card a little bit as, as how I teach this. So sometimes people will come up with a really cool experience or integrated in, interactive piece or digital piece. Yeah. I'm like, yeah, that's really cool. But like, if you had an ad at the top of that on your website, you wouldn't have to explain so much. And then you, you kind of, it would be experienced the way a consumer would do it. So kind of reverse engineer an ad for that yeah. as a piece for your book that sets up the thing. Yeah. Which I think is kind of cool. All right. So can we yeah. switch gears and talk about you guys for a second? Sure. So um, you guys were self-proclaimed big agency. You were at places you called, you know, old school big agencies. And and, and I, you did, did say, Chris, very smartly and very accurately, I think, at the end of Forum that you had said that in the presentation. However, all of these big shops that you guys have been at are now yeah. doing some really cool, innovative work. And calling something old school – isn't isn't doesn't mean you guys were disparaging your your your, no. your first places. But what was it about um, your experience? At, what was your life looking like at Ogilvy in London that Lionel was able to convince you after all the years of trying to convince you to come to RGA that it was really it felt like it was the right time to make that move? And and I guess this is either for your own careers or for your portfolios or for your own development. What what was it that sort of spurred that and each of the moves that you guys have made? I mean, I, I think I, I don't think we were necessarily doing bad work that made us leave any any specific agency. It was never really about um, the things we were doing. It's about the things we wanted to be doing and the things we wanted to try to try to do. Essentially, it's like that old thing. We weren't yeah. we weren't necessarily running from anything. We were running yeah. towards something else. That's great. Yeah, I think we've always left on good terms uh, with all our CDs and the agency. And I hope so. 
Yeah. If not, yeah. Um, creative we've never been fired. Feel free to send me a note, and I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll let him down softly. Yeah. But um, so is that something yeah. that you kind of? All right. So I'm going to see if I can figure out the way to say this properly. I think that we yeah. all. I'm speaking for myself, obviously, when I say we all spend a lot of our time in our careers sort of looking at our peers and looking at other agencies and looking at awards roles and then going back to our desk and looking at what we have. And there's this sense that there's often there's a sense that, you know, if only I were here or I wish I could work on that. Is that is that sort of like is is that either grass is greener or other goal, something that you carry with you all the time or or. Are they coming to you and you're just kind of aware of sort of options? Like, how does it go? How does it work to where you know it's the right time to go? Did, are those questions making sense? Yeah, yeah. I think um, if, depending on the type of agency you're at, if you, if, you, if you have ideas that don't fit that agency's oh, mantra yeah. too often, then you can, you can, it can be frustrating at times. And while we have really enjoyed all of our jobs, there have been times where it's like, you know, we don't have the internal capabilities to bring an idea to life. Or the client doesn't trust that agency to be able to make that idea successfully. And That's they have really an experiential mm-hmm. agency for that or a digital agency mm-hmm. for that or, that or something like sense. that. Yeah. And it's not like it used to be where it used to be that, you know, the mass agency would come up with an idea um, and then all the other little agencies would have to go execute. make it happen. Yeah. And, yeah, execute it on their own um, uh, platforms. But it's different now where, you know, you have digital agencies that are AORs like our GA. Mm-hmm. So we can come at it from an angle from digital or from social or experiential or from mass. Mm-hmm. And we can blow that out into every other, every other territory. Yeah. And that, that's where we want it to be. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, for those that don't know, AOR means agency of record. So that's sort of the official agency. And I think you said it in a really smart way because I, I remember the times early in my career when I was frustrated at my job and my wife's, my wife, who's also a creative would say like, you know, get the most out of the place that you're at. And I think that it sounds to me like you've done that where it's not a matter of, of it's uh, of, of not taking advantage of it. It's a matter of, it's a sort of almost like a, a DNA match that you want to be somewhere that, that you can express the kind of work that you want to do. And did you always know the kind of work that, that you wanted to do? I mean, w- were you confident? Cause you guys have a sort of a, a confidence that's not cocky. Was that always there? Was that something that, that was instilled in you early on? I don't know. I think inside I'm just like crying. Yeah, I'm crying inside (laughs) every single day. Um, It's weird because seriousness. Are you? Are you seriously doubting things? Do you doubt yourself sometimes to this day? Of course. Every every new brief. Every new brief. Uh, Like every now and then we think, oh, this is great, and then we'll get stuck on some little thing and think, oh, we're garbage. Yeah, it's like why am I? I can't do this. This is the one. But as far, this is the to, one to that's going to kill dude, me. Dude, dude, I hear that all the yeah. time. I'm, in this room, I hear that all the time. Really? Yeah. Like, you think that, like, yeah. maybe, this maybe is you the bring one that we're going to solve? Me? The, the self death. No. <laughs> me? <God. No. laughs> that would be the worst. Yeah. Really? Oh, no. I don't no, think no, you bring no. that up. No, no. no. I, I mean, that's I th- ever present, believe me. I think our work has evolved, I guess. I mean, I think we started doing. Actually, it's weird because we started with a lot of charity stuff also because we used to work on WWF uh, at FCB, one of our first job or our first job. Um, but we we liked comedy and we kept we were pretty good at comedy, pretty good at doing that. And recently we've evolved somehow where we stopped doing comedy and we start doing like these really serious issues. Um, we actually made a pointed effort yeah. um, when we moved to Ogilvy. Um, our book was becoming a one trick pony. It was becoming like, Oh, those are the guys that make um, funny films. The Skittles stuff. Yeah. yeah Skittles, FedEx, stuff like that. Um, what was the Skittles piece called again? I should know that. Uh, the touch campaign. Touch, there was a Skittles touch, touch, touch commercial, yeah. which okay. we did not do. Okay. The Skittles touch campaign is the, is the videos where you hold your finger to the yeah. screen. I'm telling that for the listeners. Yes. Yes. So, we, so I think the the work that we've wanted to do and work towards has actually changed. Like originally we wanted to do print ads and now we don't want to do print ads. And so that actually has evolved throughout mm-hmm. the years. I, I think that, I think that, um, Heartfelt insight and comedy are like are, are like siblings. Yeah, I, I mean, I think comedy is a way of expressing it that 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 sort of obviously there's a term for it, right? Comic relief. I mean, like there's sort of levity mm-hmm. to it. But I think that the stuff that you've done, that the the, the um, Amnesty International candles, just unbelievable. And like because it comes from a place that's sort of looking at the world the same way someone would do if it was funny, but it's it's handled with with uh, with sort of a, a reverence to it that yeah. that sort of applies the same thing. So. I, I kind of feel like, kind of feel like, and I talk about this a lot with my own portfolio. When I was in school, it was all wit and comedy, and I did a like a PSA for like this Nazi camp. And um, wait, 
yeah. a camp that helped Nazi. What do you mean? It's it's a it's camp. I forget what it's called, but it's like Camp KKK or something in Arkansas. And like these families go and they they do rallies and stuff. And like it ran in like the Anti Defamation League like a uh, newsletter, which is like a, a it's like a ADL is like an organization that fights you know bigotry and anti semitism. And uh, what that piece did in my book was uh, made all the humor appear intentional. Mm-hmm. It didn't seem like that's what I do. It yeah, seemed yeah, like yeah. that's what I did then for that. Yeah. So you, it, it's a way of kind of stretching your muscles to do different exercises in a way. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think that's a really good point. So, yeah. you know, when we went to Ogilvy, we had this book that was becoming, you know, uh, very, very one-sided. And so we decided, and it wasn't necessarily, it was a lot of funny and a lot of decent writing, but we didn't have a lot of um, design craft or art direction craft. And that was something that we felt was missing from our book. Um, so we Chris purposely, too. Chris did too. I wanted stuff to look good. I was like, why does everything look good? <laughs> and he sucked at me as an art director, so that's hard. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, he's a very well-designed writer. Thank you. Yeah, he looks good. Yeah. Good yeah. beard. I trimmed I'm today. Yeah. For real? Well, yes, I did. So you wanted to, So you wanted more craft. Yeah, sorry. So we wanted more craft. My so we, we specifically went in and said, like, <laughs> our goal was to get a design lion. And that, that's what we, so we set our mindset and like over the next year, that's what we're going to focus on. And we did our jobs and we were still funny when we had to be funny, but like our goal was this. And that's where the candles came out of was us How really trying to do that. Those made? That, you, that was another one of the hardest, it, it, it wasn't so much hard that it, it just took a long time took because long time. we didn't have any money. Like everything was donated. We actually, that the designers that we used, we were actually fans of, of course, they're uh, vinyl toy designers. Um, and yeah. we have some of their toys separately, not together. Yeah, I'm going to butcher uh, their names, but I think it's Mark Landwehr and Sven uh, Wasik. I don't know how I to probably butcher it. those names. Sorry, those Sven. Are... Have you ever yeah. had projects that like, they're so difficult to make? that you're, uh, I mean, one of the hardest things I think in this career is, is, is avoiding that moment where it's like, just get it off my desk now. Just make it make it stop. Yeah. Because it's just so difficult. Or this isn't going to work. We can't make it happen. I yeah. mean, has that happened? Or was this one that the, you had to punch through? That's We had to punch through on that. Yeah. Like We were actually, no one even really wanted to help us at the agency. So we were actually calling I, the design. Like yeah. We were calling everyone ourselves. We called Sven and uh, Yeah, I, uh, it started with me emailing Mark. Chorus because we're yeah. like, this is the design we wanted. And the art buyers were saying, like, this is the design we want. And all of our references to sell in the idea to the client were from course. We love those guys. Um, and then we talked to the art buyer and she's like, oh, here's some people that kind of look like them. We're like, no, we want them. And she said, you can't contact them because they're going to say no. And then they're going to know about the project. And then mm. whoever we find, if we try if to emulate them, similar, they're going to sue us. We have to tell them the project. You have to tell like, them the project? Well, but it was like, yeah, I, you're I just, right. I just imagine but there way, were a lot we would, of flaws but, with their argument, but, but we would never try yeah. to rip them off anyway. Right. So it was yeah. such a flawed argument. But anyway, yeah. so we had to contact them ourselves and be our own art buyers, and and we worked it out with them. I just imagine people in the office seeing you and like, I thought you were walking down the hall to go to the bathroom. It's like, no, I don't need to go to the bathroom anymore. Turn around. I don't want to deal with these guys because they're <laughs> going to ask me to make these candles, and I yeah. have no idea how I, to yeah. make these candles. Everyone hated us. <laughs> I hope that's not true. In in the in the well, uh, production the studio, project. they hated us. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a frustration, but um, yeah. you know. Full disclosure, I think I had to punch through making this stupid fucking 10-year-long experiment called the podcast because yeah. I didn't know how to edit or publish, and I had all these roadblocks. And um, that's the heart. That's the part they don't tell you in school. Mm. Like, the, you know, yeah. you're going to have a lot of – you're going to have a lot of sort of fun tasting stuff in the kitchen. Everything's going to be great. Then you got to clean up all the pots. you got to move all yeah. of them. Then you got to move all the chairs. Then you got to set all the chairs up and set the table – and like, I'm not into any of that stuff. Like, what about the fun idea stuff? Yeah. No, yeah. You, the making is a little grueling. And, and I think that like, wow, what percentage of your time is production? It's like crazy, overwhelmingly it's, bigger than you it's think it's It's a crazy gonna... big percentage yeah. of your time is is production and selling. Like I'd say oh. creative is like 25% of your time. And the rest is just spent executing and selling and producing and fighting. Yeah. Which is why as a team, we always bust our asses. I mean, everyone does, I'm sure. But like we, we kill ourselves on the idea because you're going to have to make an idea. You're going to produce something. You're gonna, it's going to take you just as long if it sucks and you're right. going to hate it in the end. Right. You're going to be raising so, that child for a long time. Exactly. Yes. That's a much better metaphor. Right. And <laughs> raise a nice kid. All right. You don't want, you don't want a drooler. You don't want, <laughs> you're going to be living with this child on the road for months. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You're going to be in a car with him. All right. You have to show him to people. Yeah. God. So um, you guys clearly <laughs> fit. Right. So what makes an ideal partnership? Um, what about the chemistry? The, um, you know, Mike, do you 
send Chris back to, to rewrite? Do you um, are you particular with the the writing craft? How, how do you guys um, uh, make each other better? We 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 ideate together all the time. Rarely is Chris off writing and I'm off art directing without the other person having complete input. Mm-hmm. Cool. Um, we basically do everything together. Pretty much, yeah. Is RGA, do you guys share a physical space in the office? Uh, yes, like everyone shares We sit beside space. each other. It's the yeah, most so. open concept That's a weird place. office that I've ever seen. You can yeah, basically this, see to the horizon. It's crazy. There are no offices. It's just, yeah, it's completely open. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah. It's like you, and you, so you come off the elevator and you're suddenly at like newer uh, Concourse C? <laughs> Because there's like a there's like a little restaurant in the middle, and then there's this giant stairway, and then these giant, I guess they're flight screens that tell you what time yep. the planes are coming in, the yes. arrival and departure screens. Yeah, and uh, they are really actually cool because they're showing the work that that group or pod is working on, right? Yep, mm-hmm. yep. And uh, so it kind of feels like a bunch of people hanging out, not doing anything. But I guess everybody's sort of off in their on their own in their little areas, getting getting work done. Do you guys work in the office? Or do you guys leave? We we generally work in the office. It just but we find spaces. Yeah. We find nooks and crannies um, and huge boardrooms that that's aren't great. being used. Yeah. Oh, to work I like in. the view. I mean, working in New York, it's great when you have a view. Yeah, it is cool. It's nice on the yeah. west side. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you you constantly together. So what has made it, what has made it work, and what has made it uh, um, what has elevated each of you from your partnership? Is that a fair question? Is that a question you can even answer? I feel Maybe. like the thing that the reason we work well together is we have the same taste mm. and the same work ethic. Nice. I think, but there's a lot of opposites as well. There's a lot of different inputs from what I do when we're not together and what yes. he does when we're not together. Yeah, we yeah. live extremely different lives. Yeah, we always have, and so we yeah we're bringing different things to the table. Our inputs awesome. are different, but our outputs are the same. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, so. I guess I'll start with Mike. What personal trait do you think of Chris has served him well? What do you think it is about him as a professional or as a person that has helped him to reach this modicum of success to this point? It's tough. Or you can answer for yourself or each other, but I'm, um, I'm, I'm switching this up for the listeners. Yeah, no, it's, it's to, it, it, to have the partners answer for the partners. It's a hard one because you don't want to be too flattering and make his head even bigger. Um, I think he just has a constant standard. Um, across everything so like for his beard to his work to like the cleanliness of his shelves at home right like he's like he's like pretty unwavering in that everything has to be up to snuff Mm. um whereas i'm not Mm -hmm. like i'm a mess most in most areas of my life um yeah all right the the symmetry on the beard appears a lot easier than it is to pull off just fyi (laughs) it's very difficult yeah especially without scissors what are you just rubbing in the mouth? No, you <laughs> gotta use a. No, you have to use a Nail like paper? a trimmer. Oh, I got. I have yeah, a shaky hand. I I could never be a surgeon, so I couldn't. I, when gotta, I let my beard go longer, I, I work with in there. both scissors and the trimmer. Yeah, that's ideal. Yeah. I just can't can't operate scissors. I just can't grow facial hair. So right. Well, you're congrats seven, to you too. Yeah. You're seven years old, you look like. So, what would you say about backward Mike? scissors? Um, I guess what's what's helped him is that. He could be a Are dick. Are you going to say you? No, it's, he could be a dick. Mm-hmm. Which, he's a, he's bad cop. Mike's bad cop. Always bad cop. So he, and that that works. I'm good cop. He's bad cop. Um, so he he just fights. He's not Fights arbit- everything. But not arbitrary. I hope that's not all I do. Well, no. We're talking about one thing. Okay. So I, I, can I, I would rephrase it to say not afraid to not make friends for the, for the for sake the good of the of work. The work. Yeah. yeah. But I prefer to... You know, I, I do fight for the work. Has it been wrong? Like, have you ever been like, "Oh crap, he's like fighting that one now"? Like, it, it, has it ever yeah, struck I you mean, like that, that was not wrong. the that, sometimes? Right? Yeah, of course. Just curious. Um, <laughs> Mike wants to say I've never been wrong. No, that's not at all. I just, I think um, throughout our careers, I've figured out hopefully how to navigate um, people who have different carrots than us mm-hmm. uh, in a better, more friendly way. It was really yes. hard for me uh, coming out of school where um, everyone that was around me had the same carrot, which was to make great work. So you're working with creative people all the time, photographers, writers, illustrators, um, and then getting into an industry where some people have a totally different carrot, which is to make uh, someone else happy or to make money. Um, to go it, home it's, on time? Yeah, to go home. Uh, Sometimes. Which, which are fair things. That's fair. Which I didn't realize at the time. Um, so, um, you know, I had a talk from a creative director, Rick Prejean. Mm. After I was uh, 
called out for being especially mean to someone. Um, and he told <laughs> me rightly, and, and you know, if you think they're on the client side and not the work side, you're probably right. But being rude is only going to push them farther away from whatever side you're on. So I think that was really good advice. Ooh, it's really, really so good it's advice. Fight when you should that. be fighting, but don't fight when you shouldn't be. Yeah, so yeah, but that, hopefully I've learned You hit that. the nail on the head, though, because uh, I've often thought about way too much about this, and uh, the way you just put it was really good. And Because I, I used to call people idiots and assholes because they had different priority than I did, mm. and it's like, you know, they're doing their job, too, and it would behoove you to befriend them yeah. <laughs> rather than demonize them. Yeah, And yeah. Uh, that's... Uh, that comes with maturity when you realize that, like, you can only control your own sort of desk, work, boat, whatever, steer your own boat. Um, the uh, switching gears radically. I want to talk about agency stuff. Sure. Um, unless you, Chris, had something to say about that, about working with you. Mm-hmm. Any, any other nice compliments you want to give me that make me oh, look like a jerk? Besides, he's a dick. <laughs> Um, yeah. I, I I love that though. I think that's really. I think that's great. You went the opposite of the uh, interview question, where it's like, oh, perfect. I'm a perfectionist. He went the opposite of there. It's like, yeah. Anyway, thanks, bud. That's how I roll. You just said he has high standards. I, I think I might. Have, this may be the last time that these two are a team. <laughs> the, the podcast that ended the partnership. Um, so, you guys presented this, and I'm, I'm wondering. I was actually curious that why the students didn't ask this question in forum. You showed these amazing case study videos and these great summary videos. Does the creative team that makes the work often are you often tasked with putting together those? Those are, I guess some of those are kind of award entry videos, or those are yeah, cases. those are all award so entry. So, do you guys work on your own campaign award entry videos, or do you have other people in the agency that work on that? Or we work, both nodded when I asked if you work. We, on, we nodded we work on a on, podcast. That yeah, we useful. we write them and create some of the elements for them if necessary. Do you um, drag or you enjoy excited to do those kind of projects? Um, I mean, it's nice, It's good to have that. Mm-hmm. Um, like, it's good to have case studies because it's. It, you put it right in your portfolio. Right. Like it's a finished piece where it kind of contains everything. Mm-hmm. That's the thing that you actually have at the end of the day. Right. Yeah. Like we don't have that stunt anymore. It was great being right, at right, the Pro right. Bowl, but we don't have that stunt. And right. So yeah. the case study is really what we can look back on as a, you know. Case studies, especially even at RGA, most agencies, but especially at RGA, um, like that's a project. Yeah, how if much time does it take? It takes I mean, a lot of time. It yeah. takes as much time as anything, basically. I mean, you're the client, which is good. Um, but... Yeah, it takes time. You have to. We have an editor that works on them. We have like a sound studio where we do yeah. all the sound for it. I mean, we generally do our own voices, yeah. things like that. But it takes a lot of time. It's cool. And then a yeah. lot of juniors that get jobs, you're talking about. All I do is decks. You guys doing yeah. decks? A lot of oh. decks. So many decks. <laughs> right. Decks left it, and right. Decks coming at you from every direction. Up it's until uh, we came to RGA, I think we were still doing sketches for things, but we. We've gone full deck now. Sketches meaning like you're doing rough stuff for client presentations, but now you're doing tighter presentations? Or or what do you mean sketches? We would, you, generally everything is just digital now. In the last like five years, Mm. it's been like you are making decks for things and that's how you present the clients. Whereas before you could, even if it was a TV, like you'd go in with a script on paper. Like I'd read a script and you wouldn't necessarily show anything unless you had to, if it made sense for the idea and you had to show something. But even that could be printed out. Now it's just we're just making decks for everything. Yeah. So would you present would you present TV with a rough record of a voice? No. Well, well with TV we present a little bit differently than um, some teams, which is we basically have nothing for the client to look at when we're presenting TV. If we can be in the room with someone or even on a call, um, and we're controlling the deck remotely, we'll have like maybe a key visual mm-hmm. up for the script. But we like us to be the show mm-hmm. for that we don't want people kind of like reading along or looking at the script while mm-hmm. we're trying to read it mm-hmm. so we'll just we because do, people don't read scripts yeah. when they're watching television yeah exactly. it's crazy it's a crazy yeah. way to do it so we present as well as we can present um you know we, we have do, several we do all the voices. i do all the female voices that's the rule <laughs> for some reason i think you should do some like, the, the next answer should be in a female voice no, it's just his voice. It's just, it's just his normal voice. <laughs> yeah, no, voice. this is it. What do you, what do you mean? Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty funny. Um, okay, Mike, you said something in forum that I thought was interesting. You said, if you like the work, then you'll like working there, right? Mm-hmm. So choose yeah. the agency by the work they're doing. I think that's really interesting because I've often contended that every agency has some amazing work that's dead. So you're not judging it because they do the good work. It's because they sell the good work. Right, mm. it's because the clients that they work for are able to, are willing to buy the best stuff, right? Yep. Because um, I think that you can go to a place that 
doesn't have good work but has creative directors that are awesome and you can learn mm-hmm. and grow and actually come up with some great ideas for your portfolio. It's just you're up against I think you're up against things that people don't think about being up against. Yeah. Like like the ability of a of an agency to sell a particular client an idea. I mean I just think the best idea – they used to have this award show when we were in New York that was the Night of the Living Dead. It was like an award show for all the dead work. Yeah. Everybody would – they still have that? So they, There's so definitely an like award it. show that does that. Is, yeah. I don't know if it's still called that. So you, you'd basically yeah. be like a gallery of all just the amazing ideas. There was stuff that like, you couldn't sell for some yeah. reason or another. Um, so you said something else really cool. You talked about how – to do something that aligns with brand values, just do something, make something, and let the PR and earn mm. media be the advertising. Yeah. And I think I asked this, did I ask you this earlier in the podcast? Yeah, that's tough to do in a, in a student portfolio. But is that how you approach briefs? Is that how you think about briefs? Is that is that baked into it? Or is that is that part of the solution? Or is that part of the ask, I guess, is the question. That's part of our, uh, it depends. If it's pro bono, <clears> then <throat> that's part of the ask. Mm-hmm. Earned media is a prerequisite. It's a requirement. You need mm-hmm. to get earned media because the media dollars aren't going to you know, achieve what the client needs. Mm-hmm. Um, but for us, it's more of a standard that we put on ourselves. If, if you're thinking of something, if you're thinking of a campaign and you think, oh, that's good enough to be on TV... Oh, people will like to watch that during the middle of a show. That but, feels like something I'd see. Yeah, but but it's not something not that but it's not yeah. something that people would share. Right. Then yeah. it's not good enough. Right. And so that's pretty much our, our cri- standard for everything. Very people crisp- share that. Very crispiny. Yeah. Yeah. In I mean it's a, it's a certain style. Um, but sometimes like all those like that for example, like do something and then get PR for it. Like that would be if you're thinking a certain way and the brief's taking you down a certain way, sometimes we'll ask ourselves something like that. It's like, okay, instead of doing it this way, what can we just, let's just do a thing. Let's make something or let's just think about it in a different way. And sometimes that opens it up. Yeah, the beat straight out of Compton is a great example. I mean, like, could you imagine if you start off saying, we need to do something that Barack Obama is going to like share on social media. Yes, of course. You'd never never achieve it. It's awesome. Yeah. All right. So final question is when I ask everyone. Yeah. Um, I'm going to start with you, Chris. Okay. Um, Knowing what you know now. Yep. If you could go back to the day you graduated from school and whisper something and you know, yeah, Chris Jokum's ear. What would you What would you whisper in your ear? What do you wish you'd known that you've learned? The first, I would say, invest more money in Apple. Right. And when would no. you? When, so when would you have sold it? You would have sold. You would have already. I sold haven't it. sold it. Yeah, you would have already sold it because no. it, it's quadrupled. I know. I, I still have. I so bought for like twelve years. I spent have like you? a small amount of money on app. Mike, one of our creative directors, got us into. Well, me. He he didn't do it, but got us into investing, um, and then invested a very small amount. And into Apple, I wish I put more in because yeah, I'd be a millionaire today. Yeah, I told my friend thirteen years later. I told my friend in nineteen ninety eight when yeah. the, right before the i when Jobs went back and the original iMac came out. I yeah, said, put some money in Apple now. I put in ten thousand dollars now. I think it'd be three point three million. Yeah, and uh, I bought some and sold it two weeks before Steve Jobs died, thinking it was going to tank. No, and it tanked not. Yeah, it tanked not. It and uh, it continues to. I go mean, up. I, tri- I tripled my money, but yeah. it w- but it wasn't millions of dollars. So you would, I think the advice you would to whisper to your young self is don't sell it, hold on to it. Don't sell it, hold on to it. Right, until you really... Or I guess that's the opposite of advertising, though, is don't hold on to it, sell it. Oh. I don't oh, even know what that oh. means. I just so besides, flipped the script. Okay, I'm not sure if that was smart. I don't know. I don't think it was. Right, besides the, <laughs> yeah. besides invest in Apple, what, yeah. would you, <laughs> what would I What would I tell myself? Um, that's a good question. You know, I think a lot of the times, I mean, I think a lot of our success um, has been, if we have any success, <laughs> it's been from just working really long hours. Like, it's just like, and we used to do that a lot. Not that we don't work long hours now, but we used to just not leave ever. Mm. Like, we just didn't leave the office pretty much. Like, we'd only leave to sleep and then we'd be back in the morning. And I think it's really good to put in a lot of time. To, to get to a good idea and that's how we've gotten to a lot of ideas in the past but it's also good to like have a life to do other things that give you better inputs into thinking of things so it's like it's like all your experiences are the things that you channel to come up with an idea and if you're not experiencing things then it's harder to come up with ideas it's hard to find that balance though because i will yeah. say like in our first couple of years, let's say our first two years in advertising, we got four years worth of experience. We yeah. were working double shifts every single day and night. Yeah. And you're not, weekends. You're, you're not good enough then either, frankly. Honestly. <laughs> we sucked. No one, yeah. no one is. I think, yeah. I think the more you do this, the bigger the room is, the more hours there appear. And I mean, obviously not. Yeah. Obviously, I'm being a little hyperbolic, but I think that you can 
you can succeed and have a life because you're so much more efficient at sifting and sorting and, and, and ideating, I think, as, when you have 10, 15 years yeah. under your belt. And uh, I, I, I've never, I don't want to say this because I'm going to sound like a dick, I'm going to sound like a dick, but evidently that's a good thing. Um, <laughs> you guys are successful. Don't, don't, don't feign modesty. Just fucking own it. Yeah. I mean, don't say, oh, we're from, you guys have won every fucking award. There's no reason to say if we're really successful. I know there's always people more successful, but I'm saying that because we had a student here who was just a complete badass. And every time she won an award in the student award show, she goes, oh, me? And she'd walk up there all, because she doesn't want to piss off her peers. The thing is, her peers all know she's a badass, so she might as well just pump her fist one time, get the award and sit down and still be every, you can still be people's friends if you're successful. Yeah, I shouldn't be lecturing fucking the podcast guests. I'm such, <laughs> a, right. douche, I'm such a fucking douchebag right Love now. It. Love it. God damn it. Uh, Just own yeah. it. People are happy for you. All right, so Mike, what's what what, what do you wish? You, what would you whisper in young Mike's ear? I think one lesson that I don't know if you can be told to learn this lesson is learn how to prioritize the projects you're working on better. Mm, so interesting. There, we spent countless hours working on things to come up with an amazing idea for a client that was never going to buy it. Sometimes for creative directors that weren't even interested. That time would have been better spent on the actual opportunities. So being able to identify mm-hmm. what's an opportunity and what's not. Because yeah. some things, is, not that anything should ever be bad. You should always be moving a client. in That needle has to always be pushed in the right direction if you're a creative and you care about your job. Um, but there are times where you can kill it and bill it. And there are times that it's worth the, the weekend. And so we weren't good at identifying those for, for a number of years. So we, we spent a lot of weekends uh, and nights for mm. for not. Wow. <laughs> so, that's, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, so I want to talk about a former student of mine. Change the subject. His name is Anirudh Shiva, mm-hmm. Indian guy. So first class that I teach this class, I tend to ramble and say shit that I shouldn't say like I just did. No. And I'm like, you know what? I'm just going to talk. If I stop – you – What's your name? Says Ani. I said, you look like an honest guy. If I just go on too long, just call me out. Just I think you're going to call me out. He goes, you're doing it now. Oh, And I love him for it. <laughs> that guy's great. And I also want to mention Ani because uh, Mike Donaghy has on his chest a Manchester United crest mm. tattooed onto his body. So if you're a Man U fan... Reach out to Mike and let him know that you, uh, you're, you're, you're a brother in arms. Um, thank you guys so much for doing this. It's oh, been thank you. Really yes. great. How, can, how can they reach you? Uh, I we guess our website. website. Yeah. What's our website? Chris-and-Mike.com. You can yeah. go to MikeDonahay.com. MikeDonahay.com. Oh, I've been saying it wrong the whole time. Damn it. MikeDonahay.com. I'm too Canadian to say It's anything. spelled with a G. So it's Mike not- Donahay. Um, and there's links on the <laughs> Facebook page, facebook.com slash DGMS podcast. You can reach me, as always, at Dan's Podcast at Mac.com. It's my electronic mail address. And um, I think we're pretty much up to date with all the um, housekeeping. Uh, listeners will be back again in two weeks. Thank you guys so much again. Thank you. Thank you. And a uh, quick shout-out to Kate Carter, who uh, came from Circus. Yeah, might as well, we wanted to mention her out. I think no one, once the music starts, people just turn the thing off. That's fair. We're not even there anymore. <laughs> She's Kate, not that important I'm so anymore. sorry, Kate. Yes, she is. We miss Kate so much. <laughs> listeners will see you again in two weeks. Till then, bye.